So, um, like Ali, Ali said, uh, my name is Julie Moreno, and I'm an assistant professor in the Environmental and Radiological Health Sciences Department, and I'm specifically in the toxicology section. And I'm also part of the Prion Research Center here at CSU, which focuses on prion diseases, but also other neurodegenerative diseases and aging. <clears throat> and um, I just want to first say thank you so much to the Center for Aging for, for inviting me to give this talk, and, and hopefully we can have some good um, conversations once I, I get through a few slides here. <clears throat> so just as, as a way of introduction, I thought I would first talk about how my journey um, got um, how my journey and research has gone. Um, and one of the reasons I, I start here is because um, I first started with looking at neurodegeneration um, in general. So what's happening to the brain when the neurons die and how do we maybe figure out ways to stop that from happening? However, as time goes on throughout my journey in, in research, I realize that a lot of this has to do with aging. And aging itself, although it's not technically a disease, it is also happening um, in the brain and is a big um, risk factor or factor that is occurring in these people with neurodegenerative diseases. And so when I say that word neurodegeneration, basically what I'm talking about is people that have Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease. What can fall under um, neurodegeneration is something called frontotemporal dementia, which is similar to Alzheimer's disease. It's just affecting a different type of the, um, part of the brain. Um, ALS is also a neurodegenerative diseases. There's some motor neuron diseases that follow, fall under this category. Um, Huntington's disease, which is highly um, genetic, but is also a neurodegenerative disease, but then, or I guess it's solely genetic, I should say. And then there's also these infectious diseases that I've done quite a bit of research on um, called prion diseases that actually um, are fairly rare, but do affect about one to two um, people out of a million. So it is rare, but it does happen. Um, and these diseases basically look like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, but super accelerated. And so um, they're an interesting disease also for us to study when you're talking about how neurons die and how to, how to maybe stop that. <clears throat> so what are the causes of these diseases? Honestly, we really aren't completely sure. Um, for most of these diseases, um, there really, really isn't a, a known cause. However, genetics can play a role. So they say in general, and this is a really general statement, but let's say Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases, the two most common neurodegenerative diseases, you would have about 10% of those people that have the disease also have a genetic mutation within their DNA that causes them to have the disease. So this idea of um, full families having um, one specific disease is usually caused to genetics. Um, but most of us, if we have a grandfather that has Alzheimer's disease, it doesn't always mean for sure that the rest of us will have it within the family because most of the time it is not genetic, at least that we know of it at the moment. One of the biggest um, cause of these diseases, and I don't know if cause is the right word, but just this idea that all of these diseases are happening in older people, um, older adults. And so people over the age of 65 um, are more likely to have any of these diseases that I had listed before. And as we all know, um, that there is an increase of the aging population currently. And so this is definitely a, a concern that these diseases, we might just start to see even more than we already do. And please feel free to stop me if um, you have any questions. We can make it pretty informal today. Um, so, so all of this said, we know that aging, we know that genetics is is sometimes a variable that cause is a cause of the disease. We know that aging is increasing and usually with all of these diseases, one of the common factors is the fact that people are of an older age. But we also know that there's other risk factors out there. So things like viruses actually, which is definitely a hot topic at the moment, um, can actually get into the brain sometimes and or damage the body in such a way that can cause these types of diseases. 
pollution has been shown to, to be a risk factor for getting um, things like Alzheimer's disease. Pesticides have been shown um, to be an environmental factor that can really cause things like Parkinson's diseases. Manganese, which is also found um, just in drinking water has been shown. Um, so metal toxicity can also cause, cause these type of diseases. Obesity has been shown um, to be a risk factor for neurodegeneration. So as you can imagine, there's lots of things that could possibly be causing these diseases. And so the most important thing is for us to really try to, to study these in the lab, um, these diseases in the lab in a way where we can, we're always thinking in the back of our heads, well, what, what are the risk factors and what other things could be actually making people sick and having these um, aged um, diseases? So when we talk about therapies, um, at least for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, there's very little out there when it comes to therapies. Um, most of them are targeting the clinical symptoms. Oops, sorry, my slides advanced. So Aricept is a really common Alzheimer's disease um, therapy that's used to, to stop, um, to basically help um, the way the neurons are talking to each other. Um, there's things like um, deep brain stimulation, which is common in Parkinson's disease, to try to get those neurons to start firing more. There's different types of um, other neurotransmitters that you can target. And then more recently, um, Ad Aduhelm was just approved um, by the FDA this summer. Um, and it's actually a way to inhibit misfolded proteins that are occurring within um, the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients. And I did a whole podcast um, for the Center for Aging where we talked about this. It's definitely controversial. And so I'd be happy to talk more about that at the end of my talk as well. But it, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting drug because it's definitely, as you can see when I give my talk, it's something that, that we're really interested in trying to inhibit is these misfolded proteins. But, um, like I said, it's controversy if this is the controversial if this is the right drug to do that. So, um, so we kind of move on to well, how well what's happening at the molecular level? So we know we have these risk factors, and aging is a big cause of a lot of these diseases. What kind of things are happening within the brain um, that we can study? And so. I use the term neurotoxicity because sometimes, um, and actually in the beginning of disease, these disease states, um, you have neurotoxicity. So the neurons are kind of in a toxic state that before they become, um, before they die basically and, and, and leave the brain. And so um, there's common phenotypes for all of these diseases that I mentioned. They all have similar things that happen within the brain. It's usually the brain region that's affected that really makes it be either Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. And so if we just look at kind of my cartoon drawing, within the brain, you have a neuron, which I've labeled pink. And then you also have these helper cells, or which might be actually more important than, than once thought, <clears throat> so these are the neurons. The purple is just my little picture of an astrocyte. And the, the orange is a picture of a microglia. And so these are two types, we call them glial cells, that when the brain is stressed or um, has a disease state or even aging, then these, um, these cells undergo neurotoxicity and they become inflamed and kind of angry, if you will. And then that can cause the neuron to start dying. And you can see here, we've just kind of, in my little diagram, show that as a, as a neuron kind of disintegrating. And it's really not until the neuron cell body starts to die. And they say that about 60% of the neurons actually have to die in order for a human to go into the clinic and tell the doctor, you know what, I'm not feeling well. And so, um, really a lot has happened in the brain earlier on in disease prior to the, the patient going into the clinic. On a molecular level, um, one of the ways in the lab that we wanna study this is to look at things like inflammation. So these glial cells getting really inflamed, it's really important for us to understand that. 
Um, another important thing that's happening in the brain during these disease states is aggregation of misfolded proteins. And so if we go back to that Aduhelm, that new therapy for Alzheimer's disease, it's a therapy that um, actually inhibits this misfolded proteins. These misfolded proteins are the things that are causing plaques in the brain um, that kind of goop up the brain, um, as well as um, different type of fibrils and tangles that can happen in the brain that you really just don't want because they're not going to allow these neurons to function right. And a lot of the kind of molecular biology behind all of this is this disruption of proteostasis. So it's this idea that the proteins aren't able to be in their normal state. And so that's one of the signaling pathways we like to look at, um, mitochondrial dysfunction. So within the cells, there's these little energy makers that are really important for the cell. And so those are also dysregulated in neurodegeneration and aging. And a lot of this you know, can also cause things like reactive oxygen species to be accumulated in the brain, which can then cause more damage and more neurotoxicity. And so these are all um, events that are occurring earlier in disease prior to these neurons um, actually coming um, to their de demise and, and dying. So I've said a lot and um, I feel like about how all this possibly could be working and, and ways that people are studying it, but how do we study it in the lab? And currently in my lab, um, we're kind of expanding the models that we use. And I think this is really important. And hopefully at the end of my talk, you'll see how using different models allow us to really ask questions um, very specific as we move up in the higher order um, organisms like dogs and people, of course. So we, we use worms, we use rodent models. Um, we use rodents that are either prion infected because sometimes that's a really good way to look at neurodegeneration or in the past, um, we can also use transgenic mouse models. However, these are, these are not your real world type um, of analysis or models to use. Um, we, you know, these mice are in a box. They're very happy, but they're in a box, you know, living in a building. However, these dogs and these humans are all having and being exposed to some of these risk factors that we talked about earlier. And so I think the, the more that we can, we can ask in a, in a companion animal, either a dog or a cat, actually, the more we can really understand well, what's happening early on in disease to humans prior to those neurons starting to die and aging really occurring. And so I really do think that with um, being able to study dogs, we're able to also kind of understand or start to understand the environmental impacts that occur that cause these diseases. So um, dogs um, have been used as an animal model for human aging and neurodegeneration. Um, it's, there's, there's some literature on that. And one of the main reasons that people have moved to dogs for things like the brain and disease states in the brain is because rodent models can be problematic. One of the reasons is because most of the models out there for, um, and I shouldn't say rodent, I, I think mostly mouse models. So those mouse um, experiments can be problematic. And mainly because um, we're having to use transgenic animals to actually see the disease. So in mice, there is no there's no natural disease course um, in order to get um, the brain to age like a human. Um, we have to actually genetically modify these mice in order to see that. And so you really get this lack of clinical presentation of the disease. You might get some um, inflammation or misfolded proteins when you add in um, genetically modified um, proteins, but you're not actually seeing the natural disease course. And so we know that the dog mimics human aging and cognitive impairment. And so there's this um, clinical natural disease that, that's, that's seen in dogs that have cognitive decline and it's, it's um, diagnosed in clinics. Um, it is spontaneous, just like it's found in humans. Um, and it does happen in aged animals. And what's nice about um, using the dog model is it's definitely a condensed lifespan compared to humans. And so here's just a little graph that shows that. So dog years on the x-axis um, and human years on the, on the y-axis. And you can see that a 65-year-old um, human is 
about a nine year old, eight and a half year old um, dog. And so that really helps us be able to kind of accelerate our um, analysis. And so some of the, the data I'll be showing you today is looking at aged dogs versus young dogs in their brain um, pathology. And so putting this all together and asking some kind of key questions with these canines or dogs, we're really trying to see, can we take what, um, sorry, I wrote weight. Can we take what we learned from the rodents? So from the mouse studies that I've done in the past, um, plus what other people have done in the past and apply it to dogs. So that's kind of uh, one of our first questions. And then um, even probably more importantly is can we learn even more from the dogs in the sense, because the dogs are companion animals and they have, they live their life with their humans, um, are we able to really understand more about the environmental impact, um, the way people eat, um, the, how much they exercise, et cetera, um, by studying these dogs, something that we would not be able to do with our um, mouse um, experiments. So just as a project over, overview, um, we're using dogs as a model for human aging. And then um, we're able to, we're kind of diving into this idea of looking at mechanisms and then diagnostic approaches. And then also we're even starting some therapeutic research, which I won't talk too much about today, but I will kind of mention it when I'm showing you some other data. And so just to show you some data, um, we do have some information from aging dogs. So aged dogs have a, um, we actually were able to find that they have an increase of inflammation in their brain. And so if we look over time, so this is a three-year-old, I don't know if you see my pointer, let me put a laser pointer on. So here's a, um, some brains that have been stained for different inflammatory markers within the brain. And so what you're looking at, um, and ho hopefully they're not too blurry for you, but what we are seeing is where there's brown staining, um, then we're actually seeing the cells being stained. And GFAP is a marker for astrocytes. And if we look down the column, we have a three-year-old, a nine-year-old, and then a 12-year-old. And you can see that all brains have astrocytes. It's just a marker for an astrocyte. But as time goes on, these processes of these astrocytes become very thickened and just showing that they're super inflamed. And when they do this, this is when they'll produce um, signaling events that are toxic to the neurons. And so um, this is what we see in neurodegeneration. However, we're seeing it in these dogs that are, that are aged. So again, here's a three-year-old, nine-year-old, and then a 12-year-old dog. We also looked at microglia activation, which are the other, they're kind of like the macrophages of, of the brain. And you can see young, there's very little staining. And this nine-year-old dog, um, there's quite a bit of IBA1, which is that brown staining again. And then in the 12-year-old, you also see those ramified processes and things. Then the next two stains are S100 beta and C3, which are good markers for um, activated astrocytes. So astrocytes that are really in that activated stage that are ready to go fight um, off anything in the brain, which um, unfortunately can also be detrimental to the brain. And so if we just focus on, so you can see here's the control, what I would say a young brain would look like with some staining, but not much. And that just increases over time when we look at a dog that's nine years old and then 12 years old. And the same thing with C3 as well. And this is just the quantification of that. I should have said this earlier. Um, our, our brain sections that we're looking at is the frontal cortex as well as the hippocampus. And you can see that um, the reason we're focusing on those brain regions is those regions are really affected when dogs have cognitive decline or when humans have cognitive decline or dementia. And so um, we see this significant increase in microglia and we were, we were really lucky here at the VT, um, because we have a collaboration with the VTH, um, we were able to pull um, many, many aging brains that had just, um, that had been there um, from previous cases. And we were able to just see an overview of what's happening in the population of dogs that are aged um, in their brain. And so you can see just overall, we see an increase in inflammatory phenotypes. 
So another big cause of neurotoxicity in, um, is also increased um, misfolded proteins in the brain. So things like the um, tau tangles or amyloid beta plaques. And so um, this is just, again, some more staining the same dogs. So three-year-old, nine-year-old, and 12-year-old dog. And you're going to get, again, see that there's more brown staining basically in the nine-year-old and in the 12-year-old when it comes to um, phosphotau and A-beta. And A-beta are those plaques, again, that aduhelm is inhibiting um, that new Alzheimer's disease drug. And so we know that these animals, um, these dogs are accumulating things that are similar to humans, as well as here's a picture of a tangle from a dog. Um, this is in the hippocampus of, of this 12 year old dog. And you can see that all this brown staining that's kind of in a ball and they call those um, neurofibrillary tangles. And so we're also seeing this in the dogs. And this is just quantitative data. Um, so it does seem like um, not all of the dogs have this increase in misfolded proteins, but there is a certain amount that do seem to have a rise in misfolded proteins with, as long, um, along with those, that inflammatory phenotype. So, um, so we know that we have pathology that's happening in aging dogs. It's similar to what's happening in, in humans with disease states, as well as humans that are aging with this increased inflammation. And so um, another thing we wanted to look at was, well, could we take what um, we have found in the worms and the rodents that had neurodegeneration, quote unquote neurodegeneration, and see if we can see the same type of signaling events because if we're seeing the same signals that are happening within the brain, then maybe we could target those signals later for therapies. And so, um, and in um, some previous work that I had done had shown that the unfolded protein response was really important in um, regulating neurodegeneration. So basically what happens in the signaling event, you have all these different um, proteins that are phosphorylated and, they basically inhibit protein synthesis. And when you inhibit protein synthesis, unfortunately, your neurons are not, are not able to um, synapse and talk to each other as well. And so we had found um, through multiple studies using different types of rodent models for neurodegeneration that we were able to inhibit this process by using drugs like trazodone um, and some more drugs that are, that are not FDA approved just yet. And so, um, so we really have this question, well, is this pathway first activated in the dogs that are aging? And indeed we did see um, that when we looked at the dogs um, and in their brains, we basically saw similar to what I had seen in the, um, the rodent models that we see wherever we see these astrocytes, which is a red stain, we also see the green stain, which is EF2 alpha. And it's also in other cells, which I believe are neurons. And so we know that EF2 alpha is increased in our dog brains that are aged. And so that tells us that possibly we could use a, an inhibitor to stop the signaling event from happening. And so, um, so we have plans to use um, this kind of strategy to, to take what we know from worms and rodents and all sorts of other kind of more laboratory models, ask if we see it in the dog, and then being able to um, therapeutically intervene in these dogs once they have cognitive decline, or just if they're just an aging dog. And so um, with all of this, we also are really interested in diagnostics. So. Um, this is all great. This is all post-mortem tissue though. So it'd be really nice to be able to say, take um, the sweet little beagle here and take some of his blood and see if he actually, if his brain has these type of things happening in it without actually having to have post-mortem tissue. And so we're in the process and, and had some really good preliminary data showing that we're able to take plasma from dogs and basically see things like phospho tau. So if I take a dog that I know, um, I guess if I take blood from a dog that I know had um, a tangle in it like this in its brain or had glial cells that were super inflamed like this, then I would be, I 
we've been able to show that the plasma, so their blood also has these things or markers in them. So it's super exciting for us because this would be a way for us to bring dogs into the clinic, take their blood and see how um, their brain is looking. And so um, much cheaper than MR imaging, of course, and just a, a good way for us to be able to, to determine if we're able to, to do an anti-mortem test. So a test that doesn't take too much money from the, from the patient families or um, cause too much pain. And then of course not have to be euthanized to see it. So um, I, I just am super excited to be able to talk to you all today. Um, I do, this is my lab. This is kind of an older picture, but a lot of us are still here. So Mackenzie Richards was really key in, in doing a lot of this work um, and Jillian as well and Amelia. And then um, I really wanna kind of a shout out to my, um, my collaborator, collaborator, Dr. Stephanie McGrath. Um, she's, it's so awesome to work with her because we just get to have lots of fun and do this dream project of, of using, um, of utilizing the dog model in order to ask these questions. And so I, I feel like we're a good pair because I do the basic research lab side. And then my students like Annalise and, and Danielle from the summer get to come over to the VTH and, and see the dogs and um, do more of the clinical trial type stuff. So it's really actually a great team. Um, and then I, I have so many collaborators, many that are a part of the Center for Aging. So Dr. Earhart in Hamilton, um, LaRuca and Davalos. And I just really, really have had so much fun working and being able to collaborate with people. This is what's so great about um, CSU and the Center for Aging is that we're able to really um, to to meet a lot of people that have a lot of the same interest and and be able to kind of put our brains all together and, and ask these really fun questions. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. I don't know if anyone has any questions for me. I did get one question in the chat so far. Okay. Um, so, that, sorry. <laughs> so dogs have very different anticipated lifespans. Can you tell us anything about the anticipated lifespans of the three, nine and 12 year old dogs that they showed us from da the data from? Right. So I think what you're trying, you're kind of saying is different breeds probably. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Right. So yeah, um, those specific dogs, I don't, that's a good question. I should know what those specific dogs were um, when it comes to breeds. Um, I know none of them were like um, St. Bernard's or Great Danes um, because they will definitely have a shorter lifespan. I know that. Um, but so that's a really good point. So with all of our studies and specifically these aging studies, we took a snapshot of patient-owned dogs that were autopsied within the VTH. And so they are from, they're all sorts of breeds. But what's really great about this is that we had, we had an N of about 26 dogs and we still see significant changes within that group. And so we, we like to think you're completely right. We have no, um, I can pull the information for breeds, but we, um, we really kind of take that variable and say that is just life. That is what the variable is. And that's also another way that it goes direct. It helps us with human um, um, analysis as well, or we at least think it helps translate to humans a little better too, because all of us are so different. And so if you take 23 humans and you did the same thing, you might see the same significant changes. And so that's that's a advantage we feel, although you're right, like different breeds have different um, lifespans. Right. Uh, are there changes in the proteostasis with prion disease, similar to aging, but just more global rather than regain specific in the brain? Exactly, yeah. So a lot of my, um, I guess, expertise would be in that idea that um, proteostasis has, is modulated in diseases like prion diseases or tauopathies, so similar to Alzheimer's, um, within the brain. And so 
um, it'll be really interesting to see if we can kind of translate that information that we know into these aging populations of dogs to help us help us understand the human side of things a little better. Right, there's evidence that caregivers of people with dementia, cognitive decline, are at elevated risk for are at elevated risk for co cognitive decline. Is there any evidence that companion dogs of people with dementia are at greater risk for the same thing, or is there an environmental risk? Oh, interesting. I am unsure if anyone's ever done that research. That's definitely something that we're interested in as, as a group, I would say. Um, and this idea of following people as well as their animals, their companion animals over time and seeing if there is any correlation to that. But I am unsure if there's any literature out there. I don't know if anyone else um, knows that on the call, but um, it's a fantastic question and why I think it's so important that we do these type of studies and kind of build this. Um, we're also in the in the process of building questionnaires for for the dog owners um, about their dog. But wouldn't it be interesting to also include their own questionnaire with them? That's a really great question. So really interesting. I agree. That would be a really interesting study. Mm -hmm. So neurodegeneration is a disease of aging. Can you talk more about how studies of neurodegeneration might change if we treated aging itself as a disease and we did more to slow down cellular aging? Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. That's like what I want to do. <laughs> so I, um, I think there's so much there. Like if we, if we're able to look at aged, aging in general, I think we'll really be able to understand the basics of what's happening to these neuronal cells um, prior to them getting into that disease state. I think if we are able to really understand those cellular stresses, it's gonna it's gonna take us far much farther than we have. And maybe thinking at that with that angle in mind. Um, I think will help the therapeutics come. And maybe that's why they haven't come yet because as, as well as we'd like, because um, we're kind of thinking once the people have the disease, we're trying to stop that from happening, but maybe we need to ask the questions much earlier and what, a, what was happening in the aging program, in the aging of the cell in the first place. Uh, last night, PBS had a program on the superpowers of bats, mm. one of which is that they do not typically show the same kinds of signs of aging that most mammals do. Average ages are 20 years or less, except for one variety, which has been detected as living up to 41 years. Wow. This sign of low aging is, is that their telomeres do not shorten as they age. Do telomeres have anything to do with your research? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I, I would say, yes, we haven't looked at the telomeres um, within the dogs. And so um, that would be something I think would be really interesting to do. We have looked at telomeres in another project that I'm part of, and we do see with a, with a actual natural model of aging, we do see telomeres decrease. And so I think um, telomeres will be definitely something that would be great to look at. And I have another uh, dog question. Uh, do you know if the dogs that you study have a decline in mobility and other signs of aging? I don't know. I would have to look at all the, I should do that and go back and look at their clinical signs because these, these specific brains were just necropsied in the VTH. So they had all sorts of things. Um, reasons why they were necropsied. Um, but so that's a really good point. I do know in our clinical trials, we are monitoring that within our clinical trial, um, which start, which is, is already in, in the works. And so we have a little more control on the questions that we can ask with that. So we, we are asking that those types of questions. It's a good question though. Jumping over to the human side, uh, someone was just told using a statin would be a good idea. Uh, 
learning about statin, um, she understands that it would affect inflammation. Could it be an insurance policy against brain challenges? I don't know. I don't know if I know enough to answer that. That's a, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's definitely going to help like your blood, right? I mean, I'm assuming like your everything kind of flowing well and things like that, your blood system. So your vascular system. Um, I don't know how much it would help with the inflammation induced by aging cellular stress, for example. I don't know if we know enough to say that really. It's, that one's a hard one for me to answer just because I don't know, I think enough about it. All right. Uh, do drugs that inhibit cells, I'm going to mispronounce this word, I apologize, senescence, hold any promise for improving cognitive decline associated with neurodegeneration? So senescence, so Thanks. <laughs> the, the, do the drugs that inhibit senescence, so drugs that inhibit the cell from growing, well, senescence is like the stopping of the cell. I don't know. I mean, yes. Okay. So I think that there's a lot out there that could be helpful. I'll say that. I think there's a lot of drugs that people have tried singly that work in a rodent model of neurodegeneration or even in human trials. They might show some promise, but I think it's really important that we all think that, think about this idea that therapeutically to stop the brain from having neurotoxicity, you know, and that could be aging induced or disease induced that we're going to need to one, it's all about timing, I think. So it's probably fine to inhibit that senescence, but is that going to be bad if you inhibit it for too long or not at the right time of disease state or aging? And so I think that unfortunately we have to really be careful of the window that we have for certain signaling events to occur and ways that we can therapeutically intervene. And that we probably are gonna have to use multiple things. You know, in a perfect world, we would take just a magic pill and with one thing in it, and then we'd all feel better and not have neurodegeneration or aged brains, but that's not gonna happen probably. So we'll have to figure out ways in the laboratory to try to stop it at different time points and then combine those drugs, I think. So sure, I think inhibiting senescence might be a good way to do that, but I don't know if you would wanna do it throughout the disease course. Cause I think that's another thing that I didn't mention very well or stress very well, is that the unfortunate thing with neurodegeneration and aging is that there are diseases of age. And so they, they're chronic, they take forever. And so when it comes to therapeutically intervening, we're gonna to have to remember that you probably can't be on certain drugs forever. And so we're gonna to have to kind of, kind of change, I know I'm using my hands a lot, but change the way we, we deliver these drugs and the timing of them. All right, I have a friend who's a math professor at CSU who has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Would you mind if um, they contacted you regarding at a helm. Oh, sure. Yeah. All right. I will go ahead and uh, send that person your email then, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, that's perfect. That's fine. All right. And someone said, love that comment. Timing, that timing is key and it may well, very well take a multitude of wealth of timed approaches. Thank you, Dr. Moreno. No problem. And if anyone's type in something and just wants to say it at, uh, out loud, feel free to unmute yourself and we can continue the discussion. Yeah, this is Lene. Oh, hi, Lene. Hi, um, I'd like to know how well supported the links are between exposure to, as you said, pesticides and various kinds of pollutants and chemicals, because we live in a very chemical heavy environment, as do our dogs. That's one of the reasons they're such good models is because they share our diets, they share our activities, they share our air. Um, how, how well supported is, are those links? Do you think they might be uh, persuasive in helping get some 
shall we say, structural changes done so that we're not exposed so, to so many of those things? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a brilliant question. I There is very good evidence of certain pesticides. Rotenone is one of the ones I, I can just talk a little about that for sure has just been um, in the last um, decade has been able to come off structurally. They've said you cannot use rotenone anymore, at least in the United States. And that um, has a direct link to, to Parkinson's disease um, or Parkinson-like symptoms. And so um, I guess there are some direct links to certain chemicals, certain pesticides specifically that I know about. There is some broader links, um, more in non-developed countries for pollution and Alzheimer's disease. So India, for example, um, Mexico City, um, there's some really astonishing um, studies where they've looked at in human patients um, where 25 year olds um, in Mexico City will have a brain um, condition or cognitive decline like um, a 70 year old person. And so um, there, it's hard to say that's for sure pollution, right? Um, but they, some of the literature says that that's, that's what they're saying it's due to. And it's more that they're pollution in, the, in their workplaces. So they're you know, in an industry that um, causes a lot of inhalation of certain chemicals. And it was more at this chemical industry that they were seeing this, um, this um, um, phenomenon. Um, so I think there's some, like I said, direct links are mostly through pesticide chemicals that I know of. Um, I think more studies would have to be done for like pollution specifically. Um, things like fires even can be really damaging. And so um, I know there's a lot of work actually being done within my, my department on that kind of stuff. 